Welcome, everybody. This is uh, Rex pop-up call on Wednesday, November 28th, 2018. We have as our guest, Samantha Slade, uh, who will take us in horizontal directions, uh, which are exciting. And uh, as we know, <laughs> Jeme is giving the universal gesture for going horizontal. I like that. <clears throat> Esty, welcome. Uh, but we start, we tend to start our Rex meetings with a poem. And I have picked an old favorite from Mary Oliver titled Today. And it goes as follows. Today by Mary Oliver. Today I'm flying low and I'm not saying a word. I'm letting all the voodoos of ambition sleep. The world goes on as it must. The bees in the garden rumbling a little. The fish leaping, the gnats getting eaten and so forth. But I'm taking the day off, quiet as a feather. I hardly move, though really I'm traveling a terrific distance. Stillness, one of the doors into the temple. Ooh, ooh, I like that. How about that? It makes you not want to talk. It makes you want, like, we should all just sort of hang, we should, can we turn this into the Quaker meeting where we all just go quiet for an hour and <clears throat> every now and then somebody pops in and says something? That could work. Oh, hell no. I'm too excited about this. Samantha, I love this. Your book is just so great. Uh, I work with a friend of mine on a book he called The Connected Company, Samantha. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were grasping to what I think you've achieved in your book. So it's just fantastic to actually see it because I spent months and months researching Zappos, you know, living systems, all the stuff that you, I can already see you've got there. And I love where you're ta you've taken this. And, and my wife also is a, She's a VP of HR for a bunch of companies, and now she's a president. And uh, this is complete. I can't wait to show this to her. This is so exciting. <laughs> awesome. Wow, that's great to hear. So I'm not going to do a big intro of you, Sam. I think that this is already happening organically. Yeah. If, you'd, if you'd like to step in and just uh, say a bit about how you got to where you are, that would be a good grounding for us. Wow. <laughs> Um, she was a bureaucrat, and she figured, didn't want to do it anymore. That's what I was. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I was a bureaucrat. I just for a few years. <laughs> I, I love that take on it. Yeah, I think I just, uh, I, I really became aware that we create the systems that we live in. They are our human creations, and we are free to shift them, too. And we don't have to see... Uh, these things is fixed. They were, they've been created and iterated for decades and decades, and we can iterate them in a different direction. And but, you know that this means I agree and this means I disagree yes. on that? Yes. Excellent. And it, it does sound so simple. It almost sounds like, duh, like you're going to write a book, a book about that. And uh, I realized that I needed to write a book when I figured out that so many initiatives that I was observing were coming at it from the angle of uh, changing structures. Like if you change a the structure, then hopefully things will change. And it's not because you change the organizational chart that people show up differently on Monday morning. And so then <laughs> I, I've observed so many different initiatives kind of just fumble and, and, in the end fail because they were coming at them so structural heavy and not from the different practices and habits. And I thought, uh huh, why is this so hard? And then I started looking around and there's nothing really out there about that kind of detailed stuff. And so then I realized, like, oh, right, on my background's anthropology, I kind of geek out on this stuff. So maybe I should just start writing about it. <laughs> it's funny. Um, as context here, uh, I, th I think you'll find you're knocking on an open door in this group. The relationship economy expedition, Rex, uh, is based on this notion that we fell out of relationships somewhere in the past. And I and kind trust. of- And yeah. trust, we, she we, talks about trust. We shattered all those things. We basically um, shredded the fabric of society. <clears throat> and I blame in part uh, consumerism, which said, hey, your only job is to go buy more crap that you don't need. Um, and forget about all those things like society. There's no such thing as society. You know, all those things don't really matter. And work, work became the most hierarchical <clears throat> um, entity on the planet. Like, like, you know, they became uh, autarchies or monarchies with, you know, the CEO as king commanding that everything be done and so forth. And for a while, I guess that 
seemed to work, but it broke people because they had to leave themselves at the door. And uh, that's somehow massively changed at this point. We're beginning to, to come back toward organizations as uh, collections of humans and all of that. And so at Rex, we're, we're busy talking about what does it mean to be back in relationship? Mm. What are the movements that are creating those relationships? How are those helping us reestablish trust? How did we lose trust? How do you gain trust? What are the actions that help you do that? Uh, some of our heroes are people like Brene Brown, who goes and talks about vulnerability being the path to authentic connection and joy. Um, and, you know, a series of other thinkers I can go through, uh, you know, there's kind of a little, a little pantheon that I hold uh, of these kinds of people that, that are, are leading us into this way of seeing, way of being, uh, this intention, right? So that's kind of the, the, the background for this group. So because you don't need to convince us that horizontal is good, I'd love to offer you to treat us as your thinking partners, as mm. a, little, a little posse of people to share, um, what are your thorny questions? What are, you, what are you trying to solve on this quest? And I think we need to get familiar with your quest a little bit more first, but, but, but treat, us, treat us as co-investigators in, in, uh, in this quest. No, I'm sorry. I'm I'm going to take over a little bit here. <laughs> oh, oh, good. Bo is apparently quite, quite, quite active on this. <laughs> Go. I, I wonder how many people even heard the term excess management. Wow, there's something, huh? Come on, Samantha. Who who's even heard of that? That's really interesting. Tell me how you came to that. I'd love to hear that. And then I, I, I do have a, I just kind of came up with a grand theory of how this all happened. I guess I'm going to go through that. Since you're an anthropologist and I, I love history. Um, so when we were an agrarian society not that long ago, and when you were a farmer, horizontal, you know, even if you were a farmer in a manor or a state or something, you still had to get things done on yourself. So when we shifted to these hierarchical um, relationship, you know, management structures. Let's think about it. I, I just recently read this book, Technological Revolutions and Financial Capital. I remember one of the interesting things that she made a note of was how, you know, the Henry Ford, the dominant like companies, if you think about it, mining, autos, we, we took those structures and applied them to everything. And so there's that thought. But I'm also just thinking like, yeah, because prior to that, agrarian societies were much flatter. I mean, there was a bunch of individual units operating on their own. And then the other thing, obvious thing, is military structure. The corporate structure is a military structure, okay? Um, so we took that. So I, I'm, I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm throwing things at your anthropology mind, and I can't wait for you to, like, come back at me. And then another thing I noticed, because you certainly mentioned patriarchy, but then I saw you notice parent-child relationships. And I love that because I've noticed that leaders – always get put in positions of parental power because it's the original relationship. So anyways, I'm just, I, I see this genesis of how we were flat in a lot of ways. Because let's face it, though, the, the people on the estates who were farmers, they still had a parent, you know, the noble, right? So, I mean, that's a, a big part of human history, right? But anyways, we've transitioned, and then we took this old stuff, and we're still carrying it on. We're still, still carrying the water. Okay, I can't wait for you now, Samantha. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to know what's your question you're holding with all of that. Oh, well, like, how did we get here? I mean, when I think about it, ag agrarian societies were much more horizontal. How did yeah. we get to, to extolling and revering hierarchy so much? The Industrial Revolution took us there. That's what I thought. Yeah. And, and, and I think, like, the way out is this path of practice, right? Because... The whole thing I, I, I see, like what broke my heart, seeing um, people who are really kind of conscious of this and completely excited about a new form of organization, a way of being in it. And the, the trip up point I kind of observe is people going, well, there's the structure part. And then after that, the part is, uh, I'm going to help the other people change. And I had this illumination once when I met this guy and he was like, I've been trying to get my whole team into feedback culture. If they just like start doing feedback culture and I just can't figure out, Samantha, help me get the team back into feedback culture. And I said to him, when was the last time you asked for feedback from your team? And he went, oh. Practice what you want, buddy. God, the blind spot, like a super brilliant, sharp, heart-filled man had not seen that. And for me, I was like, wow, if like, that's the general oversight that's happening everywhere. Mm -hmm. On um, 
Sunday I was in, uh, I, I was in uh, Belgium and, and I was given one hour to introduce Going Horizontal. And if I want to think with you guys, I would love to think on this point. Because the whole challenge is like, okay, you got one hour, you got a room. I had a hundred people, right? And, and the idea is in one hour, how can I wake up people to the idea of this is about practice. So already understanding what is practice, right? Which is in itself, not, not there for everybody. Practice starts with me, not my neighbor or somebody else, my colleague, it's me. And then here's a whole bunch of practices I can start Monday morning so I can stop, you know, having excuses for, I don't really know where to start, right? In one hour. So I have this idea that it should always be experiential. So what I did on Sunday was like a first go. It was like the practice of transparency default to open. Everybody thinks they're open. Everybody thinks they're transparent. In reality, they're not. So I, I just had people to go into threes and share the price of their shoes, if they felt like it, the price of their, apart, their lodging, if they felt like it, and if they were really up to it, how much they earn. And just to come back and share how that was sort of all. <laughs> And, and I was like, okay, that was a one try on getting a feeling of like how it's about me and I need to be feeling uncomfortable to shift my culture. And I would love if you guys have other ideas on ways you can bring people into this kind of self-awareness on practice. Samantha, did you stage those questions or did you ask them all, all three at once? Did I you said, first get them to pair up and say shoes and then no, stop? No, no. I said, I hear, hear what we're going to do. If we, 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 we're going to practice this and there's three levels. And I said, sharing your salaries is chili pepper level. And you're going to pick the level you want to go to. It's you managing your own comfort zone. Okay. And did you get any feedback on what levels they went to? <clears throat> Mostly everybody went full the way through and they explained that once one person in the trio went there, then the other two gave themselves permission. Interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> it took the first person to be vulnerable and the shoes was a warm up, and then the lodging was a warm up, And then they were like, <gasps> <clears throat> but they did say that this activity was maybe easier in the fact that it was at a public event. So nobody knew each other and they were, they wondered what it would be like if they were with work colleagues. I wonder if there is a, a sense of social obligation with that as well, that once somebody in the trio did it, then by not doing it, you would be in, in essence shaming yourself. You would be not being as open and therefore not living up to the, to the implicit agreement that, you, that one person, that, that you've made. As soon as one person becomes open, anyone who doesn't is increased, is, uh, in, intrinsically not living up to the bargain. Yeah, I'm, so I wonder if there's that kind of implicit uh, social agreement that's been made uh, in that particular context. Everybody seemed to have fun. There was like the room was a buzz and people did say that they thought that, this is funny for you guys, they were like, well, we're in Europe and not in North America. We think this would be harder for, a harder exercise in, in North America. In Finland, you can just go look things up. <clears throat> In Finland, all your tax information is freely open. Yeah. 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 And so it made me kind of curious, like, oh, if yeah. I was in the States, would I try that? How would that go? How would you oh. guys feel about something like that? Bo is still quivering from the fact about Finland. <clears throat> and in Finland, if you get a speeding ticket, the fine is proportional to your income. Oh. oh so no. if you're really wealthy, you could get a $5,000 speeding ticket. Hey. Yeah. It's just supposed to hurt, so they figure out how to get it to hurt. Right. Exactly. And some people don't notice, like, oh, 50 bucks, who cares? <clears throat> so practice, practice starts with me. So you want us to, I want to really understand fully your, your, where you want to go. So, so yeah, how, how in like a really short amount of time you can invite people to have like this, this an ex, like have an experience of practice. So we're taking it out of headspace and we're bringing it down to like an embodied experience and I, I want to do this stuff that I want to do on like a stage that I should be able to have hundreds of people to do it and so far I've experimented it's new right yeah. so I experimented this one last Sunday and two weeks before I was with the um, uh, HR professionals and so I was like hey you guys are HR professionals let's go into the conflict and relationships one that's like that's your you know that's your zone and they were like yeah and I was like let's go really juicy let's just go do a trigger log and they were like Okay. <laughs> and so the trigger log is like, um, 
you just you you share something that's triggered you in the past few days and you identify what was the context what triggered you and what happened in you when you were triggered and you share it to your trigger coach who once you shared it your trigger coach says Samantha what are you learning about yourself through this trigger mm. and we do it to each other and it's just developing more awareness of how we're bringing all our personal patterns to work and they're bumping up against other people's personal patterns and making a big relational mess every day and because we don't allow ourselves to acknowledge that we're actual whole human beings. We don't ever even talk about this, let alone use workplace as a training ground to become more conscious and, and caring around this. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, Samantha, do you, uh, and I, I assume you have sort of a palette of exercises, tools, or if not, we can help sort of co-generate them that, that lead toward the kind of places of vulnerability, openness, connection, trust, uh, Radical sharing, feedback, all those kinds of things, right? Um, you could you could have a bowl of fortune cookies in front of every table, and the fortunes inside could be one of those exercises. You know, <clears throat> uh, reveal something about yourself you've never said, or uh, Ooh, Jerry. and don't pay attention to it for a month, or you know, uh, whatever it might be. But but things that they could do. Um, and people, you could even sell these. You could go find somebody on Etsy who will make them, you know, bake them, make them and fulfill them <clears throat> and, and sell batches of, of basically going horizontal fortune cookies or some, this is just in the spirit of brainstorming, but something playful yeah. that, that people could actually sort of go through. A deck of, decks of cards are very popular, um, but there's a, a lot of different means of transmitting this because partly people lack vocabulary. They lack yeah. They lack they lack the palette of options, and yeah. what what an expert in the field can do is paint is is uh, is equip that palette with the colors for whatever the new thing is, right? Yeah. And then teach people how to mix the mauve with the teal, <clears throat> um, and all of that, right? Um, yeah, trading, absolutely. Trading card game. Yeah. yeah, and like when I did the trigger log the other day, people loved it, and then when I asked for feedback from it, I'm so intrigued by the feedback. Listen to this, people go. Samantha, I was able to do it, but I can't imagine my colleagues being able to do it. <laughs> and then they go, oh, how are your colleagues different than you? Huh? And then they, hmm. hmm. Ah, well, maybe then. It's this like this moment of like just unraveling of, of these assumptions we're sitting with. Well, we, I, I want to do about. something. I'm like, I, what I'd love to do is do an exercise where you catch them, you, you lead them down the primrose path of doing what everyone does. Be a child, project your power, your autonomy, and everything on someone else, the org structure, all. I mean, we make these gods up and we put, invest them in all this power. And then we sit there in this, you know, child, like, I wonder when daddy's going to fix it. I mean, I, I literally like to lead them through, that, let them go there and then go, look what you just did. You, do you like this world? Because you're creating it. How about so I've given myself this uh, creative constraint to be only appreciative. And, and so every time I've had a reflex to go down that path, I have, I've gone and I've tried to pull myself out of it. And so I'm going with this thing, you know, what you give attention to grows. And so I'm wow. trying to like every time give an experience of the feeling of the other way. What is a parent, what, an adult to adult feeling? What could it be like? Because that's the new one. We don't have enough experience with. We don't need to reinforce the old one. Yeah. So that's what I'm really trying to be very, very deliberate about. It's the same thing as clicker training. <clears throat> in, in clicker training, you don't punish the, the animal or whatever you're trying to train. You basically mark, you, 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 you pair the clicker with a reward, a snack, <clears throat> and then you mark the good things that you're trying to get that dog or whatever to do. And when the dog does a behavior click, and they're like, oh, how do I do more of that? But it, it opens a channel of communication. It's, it's, yeah. This is maybe a very crude example of what positive uh, feedback training is like, but you know, it works. So in all of, all of the stuff you guys have been doing and, and experimentations you've been having in conversations, do you have any like little things that come to mind that could have potential? Um, I'm thinking, Dave, um, in the work in the regenerative economy, is anybody focusing on this side of, of that, of, of opening up 
the sort of paths of control and feedback, honesty, trust, participation, connection, the going horizontal parts of this? Yeah, I was really enjoying the language because it feels like it, uh, it integrates really nicely with the kind of language I've been trying to think through for, you know, how do we create a regenerative world? Um, and I don't, I don't, I mean, I, I had been really stuck with this idea that we diagnose environmental problems all the time, you know, climate change or toxic pollution or whatever, whatever. But, you know, they're really just symptoms of business problems. And somehow in our business world, you know, like we walk into our businesses and we absolve ourselves of any responsibility for environmental conditions. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, so it seems to me like one of the things you're kind of pointing at is a way that we can re gain responsibility within yeah. the workplace for these yeah. things where we've, yeah. we've delegated away the bad shit um, yeah. to, to know we've thrown it away. <laughs> it's away. Um, and so I think you're pointing at a way that, you know, corporate large industry should take that responsibility back. And we as people in our jobs should take this responsibility. We, you know, we shouldn't be dumping shit out the pipe. Um, but for some reason we, we draw a line and then we stop at that line. I think, well, I think it was, Bo's, Bo's idea of child, we, we were acting like children. Yeah, I think it was a very intentional, there was a quite intentional but distributed effort to make sure business didn't have to worry about the earth and community and things like that back in the 50s, 60s, 70s as business grows huge. And I'm sorry, Sam, you're about to jump in and say something. No, go. Uh, so one example I point to all the time is Milton Friedman's famous cover story of the New York Times Magazine, 1970, where he basically says the only social responsibility of a corporation is to make a profit. And in the first five paragraphs, you, 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 you see the title and you're like, well, this might be an interesting argument. But no, in the first five paragraphs, he indicts and convicts any manager who so much as brings social risk, you know, any kind of worry about the environment or whatever else into a board meeting or a, or a business meeting. He's like, <clears throat> profit should be your sole guide. Um, it's the role of regulations and, and so forth outside to make sure that you don't break things. Uh, but you should only worry about profit. And this, this was a highly, deeply influential um, article, in, of all places, the New York Times. <clears throat> and it, it allowed a lot of other people to come out and say, yeah, we're doing that, and profit ma maximization is the goal, and there's a whole bunch of really bad, stupid thinking that then couples up with Chicago School Economics about, you know, uh, homo economicus and all this other kind of crap. Hunt mostly, which is what's sort of scary, is that it, it ate our it ate businesses' brain. Sorry, breaking up. Detox, like de deprogramming. I don't. I, how much? How much of your work sometimes feels like like um, deprogramming? Yeah, I think that this is about um, acknowledging that that despite kind of ideas and notions we might have, we actually have habits, reflexes, and behaviors that are not aligned with that, which is a painful thing to acknowledge, right? And that, like, and I, I think it's so painful that when I hear people talk about this stuff, I think they, like, they separate themselves out. So they go, there's this, you do that, we do that, da, 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 da. It's, and I listen really, really intently. And it's ever so rare that I hear somebody say, I and start with an I. And in the end, I was thinking it's all this stuff, like we are the system. And if we can't start sentences with the I for that and start changing just ourselves in the way we're showing up, then how can we transform the system? It's, it's like, it almost feels like this first step is like, I am the system. So or, or, or the first step is to disidentify this is with your, the system. I was thinking like, uh, I very could see it right away in your intro how you your point you're making it clear something I've always thought like hey you spend a huge part of your life at work why is it you think it's fine to be at a place where what you think what you feel doesn't matter at all where it's just <laughs> constant <laughs> invalidation. It's like, um, well, I mean, you guys, you caught that I cut my, I spent 16 years in the, in the realm of education up to the ministry, but it's like, it occurred to me one day that a classroom is a really narrow place for learning and that actually the workplace is like every single day it's fodder for learning. If we could start approaching it as that, it's like, it's the best, biggest training field that's offered to us every day. 
Mm -hmm. well, and actually, all these, these organizations where that happens, then this huge storehouse happens. And I, I know from what I've learned from my wife, a lot of the times, they don't, these organizations don't realize the learning that's locked up on all these people. And then they often, they can lose it. You know, they can destroy it. They can validate it. You know, and that, that value is massive. That's, that's one like um, little practice I've been searching for because in the learning and development uh, domain of practice, the notion is learning and development can be self-directed. Like I don't need to ask for permission to go and take a training. Like, I can show up and start like holding my own learning contract in my, in my mind and heart. Like I don't have to have, you know, some, some program that's being put in place for me or some permission that I'm allowed to do. I can start at applying my own training program for myself, like here and now. And I was like, oh, isn't that interesting? It's like, what's something you always wanted to get better at? Well, just give yourself a little kind of a learning objective and you start it up. And again, that seems to me like so tiny and minute that I haven't even tried it in a, uh, uh, when I've been doing a presentation. I was like, how does that sound to you guys? Like if I, I was gonna say, what's one thing that you would like to, to uh, I don't know if you want to if like we were going to take two minutes and give ourselves um, our own little learning intention and then how we how would you track that yourself and would you feel comfortable talking about it with your colleagues or something like that I wonder if there's space for some kind of a triz thing where you know you approach it from like if you wanted to make sure that no learning happened what would you do um, kind of and see how many patterns people recognize in their own daily behavior. Um, is it uh, the, the liberating structures guy, right? I think, isn't it called TRIZ, yeah. where you do the opposite of what you're trying to get? Yeah. Um, and again, you know that doesn't fit with my creative constraint, the way I'm applying, right? <laughs> but I hear you. Um, like, almost like, what are all the things we could be doing? So that, one of the like, things that you're making me think is that I, I, we have a bunch of uh, barriers that keep us, you know, the, the, the I'm too busy thing, like where everybody's so busy, which is, an oper which is a way we use to avoid kind of having to deal with these things, right? I'm yeah. too busy to think about, it. you know, I can't take the responsibility, I'm too busy. Um, and there must be other walls that we use, but that's the one. That, I mean, I think the economic, the philosophy, oh, it's not my job, we're just going to make a profit. You know, these are excuses in some sense for not taking responsibility and not taking responsibility is a lot easier than taking responsibility, I expect, so. Well, there's nothing more engaged than, than a worker who's learning, right? Like they ha we have all the proof for that. And so even if you just like a kind of think anthropologically speaking, you can embed little rituals in an organization that that you know from deliberately develop have you guys read the book De deliberately developmental organizations i mean there's that's mm. that's kind of interesting in the notion of way you embed it and i mean just ending ending a, any kind of like you're in a project meeting you finish a project meeting and you're like what's something i learned today no matter how minute it is and it's like it can be about yourself it doesn't have to be like information about the project or whatever it's like or what what did i learn today about myself like that's very Simple and non-conventional. Um, I'm going to apologize because I'm going to share out my brain here on de deliberately developmental organizations so that people can see what, uh, what this is and capture a couple of names of books and stuff like that. Um, so and it's very funny. My old friend Kaz Godz is involved in this. Uh, but there's a book in Everyone Culture by Lisa yeah. Laskow Leahy and Robert Keegan, uh, which I think is sort of the famous kind of start of this, right? Mm -hmm. um, Keegan is... Uh, an educator and psychologist at Harvard, part of the Change Leadership Group. Um, he writes about the five orders of consciousness. He's written a whole bunch of stuff, um, <clears throat> basically. Um, but he's talking here about organizations that decide to switch around so that they actually help people grow. <clears throat> so here's an HBR article, Does Your Company Make You a Better Person? Yeah. Um, that points to it, which was written by Andy Fleming and Keegan, oh, and, and Lisa as well. Um, so he doesn't go into the power relationships or decision sharing, decision making, and things like that. He's really honing in just on the learning. Yeah, here's one. Learning. Here's one of the things from that article. Um, in a, in a de deliberately develop, developmental organization, the root causes almost always are about people's interior lives. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's super interesting. Um, so I will I will stop sharing for now. But um, 
So what if, what if we started giving ourselves permission to ask questions like from the meeting today, what did you learn about yourself? Like, ouch. And you started just having the habits of that. Mm -hmm. And made permission for that, made room for that. But like maybe, I mean, maybe one of the things I could prototype, like the next time I'm doing a presentation is, you know, or, you know, what did you learn about yourself today? Or maybe we can finish our session with that today. <laughs> I like that. Um, I'm struck a, a moment ago when you were talking about, I think it was, it was beyond that, but um, there's sort of this tension between membership in a group and pioneering a new behavior. And I was just reading, um, sorry, I wasn't just reading, I just watched the documentary White Right by Dia Khan, uh, which, in which uh, a, a Muslim journalist, a woman born in Pakistan, <clears throat> who made her way out, um, whose biography is super fascinating, um, she goes and decides, screw it, I'm done with all these people sending, you know, all these trolls sending me hate mail, I'm gonna go visit them. And in White Right, she sits down with Richard Spencer. She sits down with a whole bunch of people whose names I had identified and put in my brain thing because they were part of the all right. And she interviews them. And, and strangely enough, they, they treat her as a friend. And there's this very interesting thing that, that I think, to me, the, the conversation a little while ago reminded me of racism, where uh, I hate all X people except you're okay. Mm -hmm. because you've become my friend and that doesn't mean that they're suddenly going to love all x people it means their their brain is allowing them to make a little hiccup of an exception in this moment and it doesn't mean they're going to try to convince their other people because they know that those people will be very offended and probably really mad and, and whatever it doesn't turn them into a sudden evangel evangelist for changing their minds although in a couple cases it does there's a a guy who used to run a skinhead band who has become an activist uh, to try to stop people from being radicalized. He, he's uh, one of her interview subjects and it's really moving. Um, but I, I think we're not too many steps removed from the sphere of racism out in our private lives <clears throat> when we're talking about these changes about how business was supposed to be done back in the 50s, 60s to overgeneralize and how we're trying to draw people into more openness, more vulnerability, more trust that the other people are actually going to deliver something if we have communications, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I, I don't know if that's too big a jump for you, Sam, or not big enough a jump for you either way. So this one here is a really great one about conflict, right? And the, this idea that one of the things that's going on at work that's like exhausts workplaces is uh, we want everybody to think like I think, right? Mm. And so one, if you can start letting, just going in at like openness and respect for other perspectives and really cherishing multiple perspectives and wanting to hear other perspectives and be learning from other perspectives. Like, what about if this one here is I was like, what about if workplaces were also the training ground for being a more harmonious society? Like that's just, you know, beautiful and crazy. So we could start welcoming in conflicts because there's show me a workplace without conflict. It doesn't exist. And whenever I talk to people about conflict, one, they wince and two, they, they like go straight up to management to sort out the conflict issues. Right? Like what if communities of people and teams could, could actually learn to, embrace and welcome a conflict and work it through and maybe what you're talking about there is like what comes to me in that is just a moment of like deep listening to a different perspective and just from a place of like openness and at the end of it just be able to say thank you for sharing like nothing else just like a witnessing sentence and to start practicing that like how can we how can we practice like living with multiple perspectives and not trying to convince each other Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and a lot of those moments for Dia in the documentary and in her work are opened up by the fact that she shows up with maybe one crew member to do sound or something like that with her camera and goes to these people's homes and to their camps <clears throat> and other sorts of things. She makes herself really vulnerable. And in, in their mind must be running the little circuit. Isn't she scared? Why is she here? What is she doing? She, 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 she's a woman. You know, she could be harmed. And, and then, you know, who knows what other narratives run through their hearts. But, but I think that, that to, to my mind, sort of a, a gesture of vulnerability is a really good opening for all these things. 
This is, this is why what I think, like, when I talk about practices, I talk about three levels of practices, right? Because we usually jump to number three. The first one is just this, like, personal practice. I can, I can start doing something, and it might surprise you because I'm acting differently, and I'm probably going more vulnerable than I'm asking you to do. But I'm starting to practice that, and I'm developing my own muscle of it. And then you go to, like, safe space practices. So I pick people. It can be work or, or elsewhere, but where I know there's trust and mutual care, so that together we can start practicing it and mess up and not like chew each other out and still be kind to one, each other, one another. And then finally I can go into my, my team and go, okay guys, what about if we try this, this, this practice out for three weeks or two weeks? And I know it's gonna be bumpy, whatever, but because I've practiced it in those two other places, I can initiate it from like a, like go quite far in the vulnerable space on it when I initiate it because I've practiced it so much and I've actually developed my muscle for it. And so I can open it up in a way that's more vulnerable than if I was just, you know, coming from headspace, hey, let's try this out, na, na, na. And everybody's gonna be a little bit self-protective when they go in it and there's nobody opening that space like that. Yeah, yes. I noticed that I'm, a, I'm an open space facilitator. So, um, and the first time I ever heard of anything like open space, I had everybody's reaction of what? And you know your 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 throat tightens, your heart clenches, your sphincter tightens, like the whole thing. It's like whoa, what? <clears throat> and 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 then the first time I hosted one, I'm like, are people going to step up and start doing things? And then now it's like, mm, you do these things, you mind the space, <clears throat> you pay attention, and then people show up. It's like it's like you're opening a magic door for them. <clears throat> but your but your perspective on the whole thing switches from. OMG, this is insanely risky and stupid and it could fail to, hey, I'm doing these people a favor by unlocking something in their heads that's already there that they'd like to go through. And once they've had a little taste of it, once they've, well, one thing I say to every open space group once I'm done, is like, okay, you are all now experienced open space people. You may not be able to run one yourself, but you could easily try. It wouldn't be hard. Um, think about the other parts of your life that this, that this is sort of similar to. I mean, I, I try to do a little bit of like by analogy, look at other parts of your life where this could work. Because to me, things like open space are examples of uh, the kinds of uh, what I call design from trust that we need more of. Yeah, like agile, agile team meetings, right? Um, I ran my first uh, uh, report workshop with uh, high level management at the university this week as an agile meeting. It was like a real experiment. It was like, okay guys, you've all gotten the report. So like there's, there's like 12 managers in the room. They've all gotten this report and uh, they're waiting for us to just like come on and explain the report. They're all just gonna sit there and they're gonna receive it. And I'm like, the report is about shifting differently. And we've just worked with a team and it's been like hugely successful and it felt incongruent to to do that way. And I kept, I was like racking my head to how to do it differently. So we got in the meeting, did a little, I said like, we're going to do a little framing right now because always good to have the purpose really clear. And so really I could, you know, we could be what's in the report, but we're not going to frame it this way. It's like, how is this experience in this one team? How can that benefit the rest of the library and the university community in general? So let's just like frame it up big. And they're like, whoa, okay. And it was like, okay, let's do a check-in. And now we're going to do an agile agenda. And we like, we put up like four categories on the uh, board. So there's like announcements and information. And then there's questions and feedback. And there was co-creation, doing work together, and then proposals and decisions. So it's kind of like a little bit of a frame on an open space, right? So it makes it like a meeting, but it's, it's pretty much open space, just like, you know, in a different form. And it was like, okay, let's co-create the agenda together. And they were like, but you're supposed to tell us about the report. And I'm like, well, if you have a question, you should be running a, part, a point in the agenda. And so people got up and was like, I got this question. I'm going to take six minutes. <laughs> and then they were like, but you, and I was like, no, this is your point on the agenda. And they're like, oh my God, this is a, anyways, we ran it like that. And we even did a proper co-creation session where they went through a listening activity and they designed who they could listen to. And then I said, okay, well, the next 10 minutes, you're going to leave the room and go listen to the people and come back and report. And they're like, what? <laughs> and so doing this, like, uh, like starting to actually bring in practices like that, where we are doing the trust and they're in a structured way and we start doing them like that, like, even me, after 10 years of doing this, like I'm only, I did that as a first this week. Mm -hmm. 
where I started to think, oh my God, I could even run a report with clients differently. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah. thank you for that. What are you asking for I'm, our help for? Yeah, Esty, go ahead. Yeah, I've been, I apologize for odd audio or video earlier. I'm uh, um, kind of reorganizing books and you know what that's like. Um, at the house, at the house level, right, multiple rooms. Um, I, I've ha I was having a, a discomfort growing and then a kind of aha emerging. So in the spirit of thinking together, um, let me, I, I, if I can, I want to put out this kind of challenge. At least it was, it's a challenge inside me. I hear um, Samantha, the three steps of individual practice and then how, how did you phrase two and three? Um, like city space practice and then yeah, prototype yeah. or trial. And, and I start to get a little sphinctery, um, uh, <laughs> building on Jerry's. And, um, and I start focusing on the fact that nothing happens at the individual level, quite literally. I mean, all of our expectations of behaviors and beliefs and models come from those around us from infancy, right? We are social creatures, right? And, and they change in a process of interaction with others in our environment. So I start to get like uncomfortable with this. We start with the individual because I think that is one of the big moves that happened when we went with the industrial hierarchical metaphor is that individuals became separate quanta that report up in kind of additive form um, up to the, the, the only person who's actually a full person is the guy at the top of, of, the, of the pyramid. Um, and then I'm, I'm, so I'm getting uncomfortable, but then I'm hearing us talk actually about having started with number three where you kind of, in order, to, in order to continue our generations or our world's contribution in this process of culture, evolution, change, et cetera, we start at, at, at the third of a full practice, right? Somebody has an intuition, somebody recognizes that they inside actually do it better, whatever, you start as an experiment at at three. Um, so, and the, the aha here is that this is yet another of those examples of we talk as if it's individualist because that's the framing. But actually, when we're successful, and the reason we're all here in this, these kinds of forums is because we actually act from the full practice um, viewpoint. Anyway, uh, I'm I, I was saving all this up while organizing books, so sorry for the blurt. Oh. I think it's interesting, this, this, like, the, this personal practice, is, I think, um, it, maybe I, I, I should be really careful when I talk about it, because in the end, the personal practice just means it's like I don't need permission. So I can show up and say to my colleague tomorrow, hey, in the meeting today, you were kind of observing uh, how I was working. Could you tell me what you would like me to be doing more of for the next meeting or less of for the next meeting? Just ask for feedback, right? And that's how I'm going to bring in a, a feedback culture, right? So it's personal and individual. I just didn't ask permission for anybody. And I'm not saying, oh, we're all doing this now. I'm just, I'm just trying it out. So there's like a, like, there's like a level of uh, giving myself agency and permission. Right. And so this is where the dance gets really treacherous for me and why we use the term, we're, we're celebrating vulnerability, right? And when you don't, don't ask permission, right, it's really helpful if you have access to what we're calling vulnerability because you, chances are, right, you're going to need it. You're, that is, you're going to get hurt, right? And even if you're not hurt consciously, the big issue here is that you will be misinterpreted and socially demeaned and, and marginalized, right, in stepping into that space between how 
others understand and you wish to behave, right, in creating change. And um, so not calling that out or something is to, is to continue to not um, equip ourselves. You know, I, I'm, I, I, for me, the last couple of years have been this lesson in, yeah, you know, actually vulnerability is not a first world problem. <laughs> It's it's a human um, daily issue, right? And I'll I'll just say one more thing. I've been in re in rearranging all the books or going through them. I found what was the first study of women engineers in a tech company done in Boston in the '90s called Disappearing Acts, and it's a beautiful description. I mean, the fact that it was only in the early '90s that somebody thought to do that, right? But but the disappearing act, the title is that all of those actions, all of those intents, all of that difference was literally disappeared from, stayed disappeared from the corporate culture and act, actually, or the group culture and actually protected against. So, um, Jerry, it's great to have the title flashed in front of me on this iPad thing. So what I guess I'm getting at is that focusing on relational practice that is starting from the place where we are already where we are not hacking ourselves first we are hacking the relational world we live in mm -hmm. and equipping ourselves to do that not just by saying oh i'm going to be brave and vulnerable and Ren renee brown you know has marvelous things for me to come home and read with my glass of wine <laughs> which i do <laughs> I think what comes to me when I hear you talking about that, I was like, you know what I'm saying this week, I'm going in front of like top management at a university and doing some crazy agile agenda with like a check-in and I've innovated the purpose up to this bigger thing without asking permission. Like that is me giving myself, that's like years of the practice that's showing right. up. That's and right. It's just, I'm, I'm, I'm reaping the benefits of the practice as I do that. Like I just did that really nonchalantly as it was no big deal. Right because I've practiced well, it so much. Well, but also it works because you immerse them in the deep end or at least in the middle end, you know, where their shoulder, they're, they're immersed up until the chin, right? You can still keep your feet on the ground. Uh, and I think we're underestimating the power of that move, right? You are, you know, it takes a lifetime to accumulate what is required to make that work, but what you are doing, right, is actually putting people in the water, yes. not at the shallow end, and not kind of in showing the them you walking yeah. down the steps into the pool. God in knows the where these metaphors are coming from. Wow. Um, <laughs> Don't worry about it. It was like this, um, I had a real breaking point when I went to, um, uh, there was a call for tender, and we were submitting something in and then there was this, you know, these juries and they're all just lined up on the tables and they have like so much power and they have like, I've got my thing. I've got my questions. I'm like taking notes on you. I'm not sharing. And you're being like, you're just, you're subjected to something that just feels awful. Like it's such a dehumanizing process. They have information. You don't have it. You don't get to ask questions. You just answer. Da, da, da. It's like, we'll, we'll call you. Da, 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 da. And I had one like a couple of years ago and I was like, I am never doing it again. And then I had this thought, I was like, oh, well, that's really going to hinder the business from growing if I don't do these juries again. So I sat there going, oh my God, what do I want to do? And I found myself with, with like faced with the situation and I met with a colleague and I said, how can we just hack this as a place of practice? And so we are not, we are not running their thing. So can we just try it? And it was like, we're going to do, we need to know who you are. I want to know who you are and why you're here and why this project you care about it. Like, I need to hear you speak from your heart before I can start doing a pitch. And then we're going to do a pitch. I'm not even going to do a pitch anymore. I like refuse a pitch. All I do is I'm going to say, when we're going to do this work, we're going to do stuff that's going to be different than the way you usually see it. We're going to do, if you accept, we'll just do an exercise right now and you can have a feeling of it okay, let's run it through. And then we actually dig into like a little bit of the work. And when they're done, I'm like, do you guys have any more questions? And they kind of just sit there dumbfounded and they go, no. And every time I do this, we're winning the contracts right now. 
Mm, that's beautiful. And I'm just like, absolutely. that, like, I couldn't physically go into those experiences anymore. Like, the, the, I was just, I was in shock state afterwards, I think, because I have such a practice of human ways of being together every day in our organization that the, the, the difference, the gap of it was just too much for me to live. And I thought that's really interesting when your practice becomes so, 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 so like integrated, there's things you won't even tolerate anymore. That's right. And, and you offered an alternative that was, you know, shoulder covering, shoulder height <clears throat> water. Emerging. Right. Yeah, so that's, that's the subtlety of like, instead of going into the anger zone or the, you know, victimizing zone to be able to, to, to navigate that strategically into something. Uh, Todd, you want to jump in? Yes. Uh, boy, that's Sam, that from the heart, uh, that is so inspiring. And I'd love to share something I've been experimenting with to get there over the last few years and sometimes not very effectively. Uh, and that's working off the, the notion that for people to bring their full selves to work, we're very much culturally trapped in our rational intelligence. So what would it be like to move into a state of intentional discomfort or vulnerability with our bodies? As, as teammates, as peers. Um, and the, the, the three levels is fascinating because the first thing that I typically ask is for people to stand in a circle and start shaking and throwing parts of their body in succession. So shake your arms, shake your shoulders, throw your hips. And you can see, and with the principle of invitation and agency, just do it to the level you're comfortable doing, and you can see the room start to shift a little bit as the exercise progresses. People start moving a little bit more as they feel permission and look around. And then at some point, moving to a second stage where instead of inviting bodily participation, we're inviting eye contact from a distance, not close, which is too intimidating, to stand in that circle to ground in yourself and just see your teammates. And then moving, what, what I want by the end of the day is to have movement around the room where people are actually playing and dodging one another and playing little games in pairs and threes and they can feel what it's like to be um, on a team not talking but on a team and playing off, re being responsive to one another. Um, and that I feel like has added just a, a layer of effectiveness to the, the talking through, um, because even if we talk about our finances or our shoes or our titles uh, or our fears, that's still, a, a, I think for most corporate culture, that's a safer zone than saying, um, I have legs, arms, feet, and hands. And part of it, the, the way this connects to the heart is that um, I believe that from moving to rational intelligence to whole body intelligence and getting to the heart, just finding ways to dislodge us from our head focus, um, having vulnerable conversations can definitely move us into the heart. But if we just loosen up some of that energy, sometimes we can get there too. Yeah. And that almost feels like if you do it for a little bit, the first time you feel kind of awkward and the second time, not so much. And the third time it's just like, whoa, we're doing a shaky thing again today. Yeah. Yeah. You're back to that. So something that's bit... no, go on, please. There's this um, one thing that we've been trying out is uh, using this notion of representation. I don't know if you guys know about constellations and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, so, raise, raise your hand if you've heard of family constellations or other. Okay. So like, I don't really talk about it with the groups like the back end stuff. All I say is, okay, if you, cause what we, we have very little practices of dealing with conflict. And so one of the things that, that, that I bring in with groups, so maybe this, I don't know, 
like one hour it doesn't work with this it's a little bit longer time but basically you you think of a conflict that like a, a, tr a tricky situation that's kind of grinding at you in your work space and that you know we don't really have skills how to think it through how to deal with it how to get to the bottom of it and really kind of have spaciousness around it right we're mostly just kind of stressed about it right and so this one is think of it and um uh identify a question that you have around it. So like you're, you're giving a question framing and then you find a partner and you don't even say anything to your partner, but you look at your partner and you, th and you choose an element of the system related to your question, whatever is appropriate. Like the last time I did this, I had some question about a new hiree that we had at Perk Lab and, and like, oh, if, if we'd been doing enough and whatever for her onboarding. So I just like, in my head, she was the new person that we'd hired, so I was in, right? But I don't tell her. And then I position her somewhere and then I just start, um, I just start moving close, far away, beside, and I'm just like quietly, sensing how it feels for me and moment and so i'm just using this person as representing an element of the system and i'm holding a question which i'd like to have more clarity on we do this in silence it lasts eight to ten minutes depending on the mood i'm in and at the end we debrief and i'll be like how did it feel for you and the person will say oh when you came here da, 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 da. and it just sounds like they're telling you random information and somehow every single time it illuminates some insight around the conflict it's just like the weirdest thing ever i haven't tried to like rationalize it but it makes me feel like todd you're talking about this like you know body wisdom and and there's something about it. And I mean, I, the whole thing about constellations is, is yeah, we're capable of carrying stuff. And I, you know, I don't know if you believe it or not, but either way, this kind of always is revealing somehow. And, and helps to, um, it just takes something that we have so, uh, so much up here and it releases it uh, because it's coming at like random information you're getting into and you get unblocked out of the conflict that's just been kind of tormenting you. We're headed later in the, our sequence of calls toward um, talking about uh, Bessel van der Kolk's book, The Body Keeps the Score, Brain, Mind, and Body in the Healing of Trauma, <clears throat> which is, a, 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 again, a bit of a giant leap from the present conversation, but I think pretty germane. You know, I, I think that we're all of us are taking our personal patterns and traumas into our workplace every day. And there's such mess just coming up around that and so much distraction from it being a place that feels, you know, healthy and mutually caring and efficient and productive. And if we could start just like focusing on that a little bit, there'd be something, I don't know. Um, there's also sort of institutionalized trauma. Um, there's things about Social, social norms and the things we do all the time that we don't think about that actually sort of reinforce different kinds of long-term trauma. And, and we're just not aware of them. Um, so I think that that, um, that sort of layers on top of or behind or however mentally you want to place it, the individual trauma that people have and uh, makes it harder to, to talk about, to raise, to, to do stuff about. I, just want, I stuck a link in the chat about with uh, Ezra Klein's interview with Jonathan Haidt about um, his new book, I can't remember what's wrong with America or something like that. It's pretty much a, you know, these damn kids are all ruined kind of thing. So I, was, I found it a little hard to swallow, but, but maybe there's something there, but it seems like, again, Sam, you're kind of pushing on these things that would be, would help. I mean, he's arguing that millennials are coming into the workplace with no capacity to cope. They want safe spaces. They're worried about trigger warnings. If somebody offends them, they go immediately to, to management to fix it, those kinds of things. And I don't really know if those are problems that are going on, but you know, to me, they, they rep represent the, the kinds of situations. I mean, maybe, maybe it's an exaggeration of what we've been seeing in business forever, but um, uh, he's saying that it's a particular problem now and that we're also seeing a lot of, uh, um, I think he was using like the number of girls who are cutting themselves as an indicator of trauma. Um, mm -hmm. That number's gone way up, not just in the US, but in other countries as well. I don't think this is the interview you're talking about because this is Chris Anderson interviewing Jonathan um, a, a right after Trump is elected before the inauguration. <clears throat> but I think a lot of the, uh, the same issues come up in, in this one. And 
as you'll see, when I, when I hit a video I like, I debrief into the brain. So, <clears throat> so these are the notes that I took uh, while watching that video. Um, and this is a little deeper than we need to go right now, but all this stuff is available. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll copy this link and paste it into our chat. Wow, that's sweet. So you can go look at it on our own time. So this is going off in a somewhat different direction, um, but it's been gnawing at me for much of the hour. I can totally see and totally understand how these exercises and these models work with uh, knowledge work and knowledge adjacent work. Uh, I'm just wondering how does this apply to the Amazon warehouse worker or the call center worker or the delivery driver or, you know, basically the Walmart clerk. Does this, is this basically only limited to people who are in these relatively, you know, secure, relatively wealthy positions or is this, or, or do these models, have you thought through how these models and these ideas work for people who are in, more in the precariat? So, I, I mean, my hypothesis is this is for everybody. This is just mm -hmm. about um, human beings. And what I tried to do with the book, and I, walked, I really walked it through with my editor every time we would walk through any of the practices. And the, the idea of coming at these seven domains of practices mm -hmm. is that they're pretty much common to everybody, uh, irrelevant of the kind of organization that you're in. True, some, some professional fields means you're having meetings you know, 10 times a day, whereas other fields, you'll barely be having meetings. But if you start looking at what is a meeting is just, you know, even when I'm having my break and there's three of us having a conversation, that's a moment that's a meeting. So if you start like bringing in the thread of what we're doing at meetings is just an extension of when we're a family around the table trying to figure out our vacation and bringing that into work. And so how am I showing up in a way that like we're around the table, nobody gets to be the head and make the decisions for us all where we're in the family. And so when I'm in other meetings, how do I bring that practice in? Da, 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 da. So I think every context is going to be completely specific to the individual to figure out what's, what form those practices are going to take and what's going to be like their leverage spaces that they'll meander through in their organization. And I really think that, um, we need to kind of let go of this notion that horizontal is like a model. It's kind of like what I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful of is that we're only at the beginning of like a whole planet of all sorts of diverse forms of horizontal ways of being in organizations. In some places we haven't really even seen them. And I think they're gonna grow and and I don't think we you can even imagine them now. Cause it's like, we have so many forms of the vertical and we have barely anything going on in the horizontal. And right now we look at horizontal and we go, oh, that's horizontal. And for me, <coughs> that's not horizontal. That's just the like the emerging tip of what horizontal is looking like. And there's this whole, whole world of what it could be. And so, that's that's my hypothesis so that's why i think it's relevant everywhere and the more we take it into places where like the constraints may, seem to make it like i can't really imagine it i'll think that that'll be one of those places that a new form will emerge have mm -hmm. you seen it applied in places like that uh yeah because it is applied in factories and and plants like that like the the biggest example is the um um Morningstar tomato production factory in California, right? Which is one of the biggest um, producers of tomatoes in the States, I think entirely. And they are functioning in, with these kinds of practices there. Mm -hmm. And so that's not mm -hmm. at all like a knowledge worker kind of place. So that's just a simple example. Um, and I'm, I've actually got a, a, an angle in this to answer Jamie's question as well, which is that um, there's a bunch of research that basically says, and I'll, I'll point to, to a spot in my brain that says this, that autonomy at work leads to better health and well-being, um, even to the point where if you can schedule your own breaks. Like, like, like we have constrained people so much, and now with technology, we can monitor every aspect of their behavior. <clears throat> and it seems like the people who are running Amazon and the people who are uh, programming Uber and all these other platforms have no comprehension of this. Um, and the shit is going to hit the fan because uh, basically 
uh, they're violating all these normal sort of facts of human nature. Uh, people are, are just like little puppets and robots in these systems. And they're disposable. Have, they're they're disposable. disposable and they have to pee into a bottle because you can't run across to wherever the restroom is and you know, all these terrible things. And Uber is a fake marketplace. You don't get to set your price or bid on things. If you refuse rides more, you know, if you don't tick 90% of the rides offered to you, you get dropped as a driver. <clears throat> and you don't know where the ride's gonna go when you press yes, right? Mm -hmm. There's so much information being hidden from you. And then Uber started splitting what it was charging uh, riders from what it was actually paying drivers. They couldn't see one another's information. So that started getting meta compared by other people. And they're like, damn, Uber's just getting away with absolutely everything. Yeah. And, if, and if this was a worker-owned co-op on a different platform, which is a whole conversation of platform cooperativism, yeah. that would not be happening. But because yeah. Silicon Valley has basically eaten these businesses, uh, Silicon Valley plus that green state up on the west side um, where Amazon lives, um, they've kind of eaten all of this without paying a heck of a lot of attention to anything, but how do we get people to do the most work for the least amount of money? This is going to not end well. And we're already seeing tech lash, right? And I think that like, if we want to get to those economic solutions that are more, make a fair and more fair and equitable society, like these kinds of practices are, are helping us be more human together. And I think we'll grow to them towards that direction. So sometimes people say to me, oh, but like you should maybe start until like, you know, the whole organization has an organizational shift. And I'm like, oh my God, that's like saying, let's not save the planet until somebody gives us permission to save it. Like. Or until all the fish are dead. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> yeah. What, what are we waiting for? Like, like, let's just do it. And it's like, you, when you start doing this, you don't know where, what you're gonna be unraveling and what's gonna come with it. And I don't think we should even like try. It's just like, start going there. You might unravel something in your organization. You might unravel some new opportunity for yourself. Like, we don't know. Yeah. Um, but uh, so a lot of this worker autonomy stuff goes way back um, one of my mentors in, um, in grad school was Russell Acuff, one of the founders of Systems Thinking. Uh, he had a concept he called the lowerarchy. He said, you know, we have companies that are hierarchies. Why don't you just mentally flip it around and make it so that the, the responsibility for doing stuff is down here at the fingertips with autonomous work groups. Mm -hmm. And that the job of every, every rank lower in the lowerarchy is to resolve conflicts, only those conflicts, that the, the people at the top, uh, at the top, uh, at the fingertips can't resolve by talking to each other. And it's everybody's job to connect with all the other groups whom you were, your, the thing you're trying to get done is going to affect. And, and the CEO should only be resolving the conflicts that make their way all the way down through the lowerarchy. And that was something back in the 70s. 70s I right? think this stuff has been around for like a long, long time. And like you yeah. see organizations that are doing it and there's been books written on it. The thing that I don't see though is most of the books are speaking to upper management. Mm -hmm. and the leaders they're not speaking to anybody and everybody in the organization who can start moving something forward and i think that's no, they're that's speaking to the decision makers yeah. Yeah. In, in in hierarchical organizations that need to yeah. need to change you're speaking to the people who can actually make the change because uh, you know the warehouse workers at amazon and the uh, call center workers they're not going to be able to make that change independently um what's what's funny is as you as you're talking, it strikes me that one of the biggest examples of precisely the kind of organization, the lowerarchy organization, a lot of what you're talking about, flattened, you know, semi-horizontal that you're talking about, is actually the U.S. military. The military, Amer the American military has done an outstanding job of um, pushing responsibility down, you know, down the hierarchy to the end to the to those individual soldiers who actually have a lot more say over what they do and where they go and how they respond, you know, given the rules of engagement. It's actually not something that we conventionally think of the military as a classic hierarchy, and it's not. Anymore. So, um, really brief tangent and a little bit of military history, but it's a, it's sort of amusing. I'm watching a series called Babylon Berlin which is a terrific, terrific series set in post-World War I Germany, which is a detective mystery and an espionage novel and whatever else. And at one point, there's a plot point that there was a pilot training school in the Soviet Union. And I'm like, what? <clears throat> well, it turns out that under the Treaty of Versailles, Germany could not create a standing army. And one of the restrictions was the number of officers per, uh, per um, soldiers and the size of the army, all of that. This restriction, caused the new German army being developed sort of by this secret little group of the Reichswehr um, to go develop 
extreme autonomy for the, 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 the squads on the ground. They, they created something called um, reconnaissance pull, which is really interesting in the middle of maneuver warfare and all the <coughs> inherits in 33-34, starts in 23, and is probably one of the best armies ever on Earth. And our mental ideas of armies always being hierarchical and command and control is totally off. <clears throat> Occasionally they are. So the American army coming into World War II is terribly hierarchical. The American army that hits World War II is awful. Like everything, you, if you disrespect an idiot that says something above you, you're court-martialed, you're gone. Uh, German army, one of the best armies ever going into World War II, sadly, because um, that means they're just more efficient at doing really terrible things to the world. But, but this sort of, this applies in so many places, it's crazy. Sorry for the warlike uh, digression. <laughs> well, I think the purpose piece is there a, a, a little bit within this, also this shift to more horizontal organizations because as you go through this like as you go you go up and go into the horizontal stuff like at one point you you do get to issues of uh, being open and transparent and sharing information and as you start unraveling that then we get to the things about finances and as you unravel that then you get to to business models like it's in the book, I don't talk about this. Like, let's just let's just start some really first level entry points. This is like a mainstream book. It's really positioned as that. There's a subversive nature to it that I can share with you guys because we're 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 in good company. But like, I really just think that instead of instead of being in a position of being angry or victimized, this kind of place of beginning to take agency is a way for the whole thing to be unraveling and organizations is a great entry point but it could be community groups it can be anything and agency is one of the big words here in, in the rex conversation and it's one of the biggest words for me because part of what happened um, my own version of history when we consumerized the world is that we remove we remove people's sense of agency because <clears throat> my only agency really as a consumer is to go buy stuff and I should be buying the stuff that's put on offer by advertisers. And I shouldn't really ask too much about it. I shouldn't ask where it came from. I shouldn't ask if I can make it myself. I shouldn't try to share it because that means we're going to buy less stuff and the economy will go down, et cetera. And so we've effectively cut away most people's sense of agency. The, the hierarchical nature of most corporations in the 50s, 60s, 70s did that. It, you were not allowed to, you had to swim in your lane and you, you were hired into a post that had very narrowly defined you know, boundaries. Um, so we've done this to people for so long that we assume that that's what, that's what it's supposed to be like. And any other arrangement that relies on trust feels really dangerous and threatening and so forth. And, um, and I love that about sort of the, uh, working in the realm of trust and agency and, and autonomy and, and interrelationships and all that because um, it's fun when you're involved in something where every now and then people get this like clenching feeling. We're like, no, 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 that can't possibly work. And then they're like, oh, oh, wait, oh, wait, it's working. Yeah. Right. I, I, I call it in a couple speeches, I've called it the, the two oh shit responses. <clears throat> the first response is, oh shit, this could never work. And then, and then you try it. And some people bounce off it at that point. <clears throat> they walk away, they can't deal with it. But the people who try it and then see that it works are like, oh shit, this is working. I'd like more. Yeah. That kind of connects with the notion of practice again. Very much. So uh, one of my big open questions is, how do we get more people to practice more of this stuff at any level? So what I've been astounded by is that as I go out in the public and I've been, I've, I've made this promise to myself that I just say yes to any invitation I'm getting right now, right? Like so I'm practicing saying yes to invitations. And I go on out and I'm like, and I'm also, I, every time I will make sure that when I, when I, um, when we start the check-in, I'm asking people to start with is like, what's a practice you have? And I go super vulnerable and I share some practices that I have that like people, you know, kind of laugh at me. And then I also share the fact that it's like the fire in my belly, why this work is important because I have a hands-on, like a real life experience of um, falling into the human trafficking ring and being sold as a commodity myself and stepping out of it and being able to save and be here today. And so I've got these two little kind of entry points that gets people's attention and shows my vulnerability. And then people are going into this 
them sharing, then they, they, they just, they can't really say no. And so then they go in pairs and they share their own little practices. And they're kind of like, why am I sharing that I practice eating strawberries every, you know, once a week? Like, why am I sharing that? And all of a sudden, as I talk, everything's landing personally. And so for me, I just want to keep doing that more and more and more. And, and, and inviting other people who were talking about this stuff to come at it from that personal level. And it feels, as I watch like speakers and talkers going around, I notice that so much of it is like heady outside, this thing you're looking at, that it's outside of yourself. How do we just be like, bring that in? So this is, it's new for me. And I'm, as I look around, I'm not seeing very, other, I'm, I'm, I haven't really seen other models or speakers or, going around from this like hyper-personal level talking about organizational change. Yeah, uh, the person who joined our call because she had another call for the first hour is April. And I'll mention that that um, I think we're set to go 90 minutes, if that's okay with you, Sam. I don't remember yeah. what, what we'd prepped. I forget what we said I was gonna ask. Yeah, sorry, I, I meant to say it at the top of the hour so that everybody okay. would sort of know where we're going. Um, and April and I both do speeches and, and things as you do. And I think that, that one of the challenges that April and I face is how to do what you're describing, which is how to help people um, identify with themselves when they're sitting in an audience, <clears throat> how to not be a mere audience. That's why I teach these things all the time. It at least opens up a, a little channel of communication. Um, but how... So that you know, physicality that Todd was describing earlier um, also plays a role. And I, and I don't know, I'm not very good at all these things, <clears throat> but I think they're, they're all kind of equally important because they all allow different parts of us to show up. And once, once you can engage a couple different senses, um, I think the, the intellectual barriers that are going to be really good at resisting a, an intellectual argument, even though it might be a pretty good one, uh, are confused and, and ground down and like... <sighs> All right, all right. So I guess this is about me. Yeah, yeah. And the, and so when I when I'm finishing uh, a talk, like when I finished on Sunday, I said like my in, intention. I named it at the beginning was that that you guys would leave this room understanding what practice is, and that the practice starts with you, and some concrete practices you can start with next week. And like, have we achieved this? And showing hands at the level that you've achieved it. And everybody raised their hands. And so it's like, okay, so we talked about the price of shoes, the price they're lodging and, the price, and how much they earn. Was that enough to get like that feeling? It's, yeah. I'm really playing around with this right now. It's like a completely experimental. That's fun. It would be fun to find a way to share experiments and, and outcomes and things like that. And, and <clears throat> I, um, I'm trying to work as openly as I can in the world and, and share resources. So <clears throat> there's a, you know, liberating structures is a, a really deep well of group process techniques and, and resources. Um, I would love there to be resources like we're talking about here about um, things you can do with humans in a room um, that will cause them to connect with themselves, that will cause them to have a felt sense of agency, that will give them an experience of feedback or trust or vulnerability or whatever it is, just so that we can, you know, uh, have a, a wider range of tools um, to use in different situations. Yeah. I, I try to blog about this stuff and make sure it gets shared out, but that's not, it's not a structured way of sharing like liberating structures, but maybe it'll turn into something. Um, I'm happy to pursue that question with you in, in, in different ways and see what, uh, what we can do, so. Oh, sweet. Um, we're nearing, I, we're, go ahead, Esty. Um, I, <clears throat> I just wanna ask this collection of people, um, and Samantha first. Magnificently, you're in the center of my gallery view in Zoom. So it's perfect. Um, so what are we doing? We're just pushing aside the economics um, of, of the situation here. I mean, um, to put it crassly, a number of people in a number of these rooms that we're activating and changing could be fired, <laughs> not in those rooms, right, as 
um, as a matter of economic fact. And um, right now we are in kind of boom times where there's generally more latitude, right? In, but who knows? So I'm just giving voice to the little things under me and are we anticipating that there will be change in economic structures or are we just, uh, or, and, and that there's a, a step in this strategy that we're all uh, inventing and enacting that it takes that <coughs> on? Anyway, I think you got my, my jest. I'll mute myself. So I think just two or three things. One is I think that um, each person has to like navigate what they're going to be proposing in their in their work environments um, with their own level of risk taking really consciously right to not just be like Woohoo, I read a book and I'm supposed to do this oh I got fired right and and I've been really careful throughout the book of like with my editors like you got to put that again you got to put that again because they're really careful that some people might do that. And I think that this is going somewhere where their economics has, has an impact, right? And like, we live in a hugely unfair and unjust society and organizations right now are contributing to supporting that or not. There are those that are conscious and they're shifting things and there are those that are not. And I mean, I, I, I don't have the crystal ball, so I don't know where it's going. And I think there's all sorts of different theories around that. But again, we're coming from my hypothesis is the more we practice these practices of openness and transparency and all of these different things happening is that eventually you're going to get to financial transparency. And as soon as you start getting at financial transparency, you get to this, this, these things about a uh, more equitable distribution of resources. Right. And that could lead to all sorts of stuff going on in people's lives. And at the same time, we're facing a socio-ecological transition that's going to come bumping us up in the face anyways. And so, yeah. So I'm, I'm hearing, <clears throat> I'm hearing SD bring into the conversation a fear that the quest for autonomy or experiences of vulnerability and expressions of vulnerability could put people at risk in organizations that aren't ready for it. And then from partly from what you just said, Sam, um, and one of my realizations is this way of looking at the world can be seen as, you know, a uh, flesh eating bacterium to somebody who is in a hierarchical uh, organization and has a lot of rank and seniority and would like to preserve that. <clears throat> right. So, so what you do is you cut out the body parts that are infected. You do whatever you need to do to stop this infection of autonomy and people who are actually authentically showing up to work and whatever. And I'm, I'm overgeneralizing here. And I, I and I, I don't know. My felt experience is not that that's happening. I've not run into a situation where I felt that was going on. Um, although I've seen a couple projects die because management just let something happen and then let it just kind of didn't dip back in, right? Because because in, in some cases, these initiatives need uh, somebody's support to continue um, to take effect across a company. But, but we are talking about a large scale movement to change the way organizations think, see, and act, right? Which is sort of what you just described. And that puts a bunch of people at risk who have firing power over other people. So I, I, I'm hearing SD is concerned pretty, pretty loud and clear. Mm -hmm. Right, there's a, there's a power thing. And, and it may not even be only conservative power or you know, preserving the status quo. It may be, gee, it really is in our interest to have more gig workers, right? Less salaried workers, more contract workers, more mission oriented, meaning short term deliver. It's, a, it's not a job description, it's a, it's a gig description right, a la Reed Hoffman's book, right? All these shifts in the structure and the contracting of work, which, um, which happens, you know, we're talking about systems here. I, I'm not a, a, generally, just for Samantha's sake, I'm not, a, I, I'm a humanist. I actually believe in human beings, right? Um, but I'm also, I also believe in systems and, and uh, and 
multiple competitive, multiple things happening at the same time, including, which can result in some very strange adaptations, depending on who has power. That's the way we call it uh, in, in the human world um, over, yeah. over others. And I know I, I just feel like maybe it's my particular story, but we have quite enough evidence and experience at this point to say the economic structures play an immense role here. And yet I don't hear us, um, I, I, I'm asking, what do we have in mind there? What is there, if we, if we zoom up or out or something and pose that question to us, um, so, so I go straight to the donut economics from Kate Raworth. I love which is, her. Which is seven, you know, yeah. different ways of looking at the 21st century econo economy. And I, and, um, I met with her on Sunday and talked about collaborating with her because the economic, like, uh, perspective is, is taking it at this really high level. And without the cultural perspective, you're not really going to get there. And I really think they go together. That's a good answer. Is is her? Is Kate Raworth? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. There's there's one other way I look at this, Esty. Um, that this going horizontal is a aspect of a larger movement, and that um, mm. the power issue, reframing power, is at the center of that movement. Um, because we've been living with this notion of power that is is largely power over. There are many people with power over us. And I hate the word empowerment because I don't feel like that's, that's not a part of going horizontal as saying I empower you. That's saying that I'm, I'm more above you. I'm, give, I'm granting you power. Books like going horizontal that actually start a power within that becomes a power with um i mean i'm an optimist but i do believe that if when people tap into their real power their real true power and connect with one another a lot of the structures that are holding us back will will topple under their own weight and that's the that's the belief i choose to maintain and and todd what that brings up for me is I think we all just learned what it means when an actor in the play um, empowers himself to do non-conforming things, right? Who wins, right? Who's, and who's vulnerable, right? In those, um, and what, and what structural systemic uh, protections have we put in place? I hear you. I mean, I, mean I, I feel like my knowledge of <laughs> very strange thing to have sorted all your books while the while California was burning and you couldn't go outside, right? So I'm I'm suddenly aware of all the of many pieces before I started buying Kindle books of my own um, interest and understanding of history. And we have many, many examples of quite horizontal communities. We have many examples of, and, and of epistemologies in ways. Um, we have many examples of different labor structures. We have many examples out of Germany of all of these things, right? And of the pride um, of uh, early 20th, century Germans in their cultural superiority, it was because they had all these um, kind of lovely beliefs and culture. Anyway, um, and a person playing by different rules or, and, and we're seeing Right, in this country that those rules may have no coherence. They're just simply the ravings of a, um, 
want, I don't want to say maniac, but I can't find another word. <laughs> right. Um, when, when those groups, and it's the same with terrorists and other, other fundamentalisms that, that, that put other societies, right, on defense and then crumble. And are we, are we going to leave that aspect of the system design change making that we're creating out of our conversations? And I really mean this as a question. And we've run over our, our a lot of time. So I think, um, uh, Sam, I'd love to give you the last word. I, really hard to answer in a short period of time, but if, if you wanna um, just offer some concluding thoughts and then we can maybe pick this conversation up some other time. Well, I actually uh, love the practice of living in questions. So I would just like to hear a question that's popped up for each of us as we as we check out. I think for me, it's very much the one I articulated a little while ago, which is how do we leave the, how do we leave simple things at hand for everybody that they might learn these practices and get a taste of more agency of uh, more connectedness and so forth. And, and I think that my own, the belief behind that is that this is pretty contagious <clears throat> and that um, that would be a really good way to transform organizations because it, uh, trying to convince the CEOs and C-suite people to make these changes is the long, hard, almost impossible slog. Yeah, mine is probably related. That, and it goes back to the question that I asked earlier, and that is how do you implement these kinds of ideas in the layer, organizational layers that need it most? And I don't, and I'm not sure how to answer that. Anybody else? Why is my heart beating so fast and, and am I, why am I on the edge of my seat for 90 minutes? Too much sugar. <laughs> yeah, I guess I've been thinking about it in terms of the, the generations, thinking about my kids leaving college, you know, and, and going into these environments, what's it going to be like? And I guess watching them and the people they hang out with, there's a ton of agency. And I kind of wonder if in some sense they'll be carrying these messages, um, you know, so the, the Jonathan Haidt stuff is backwards in some ways, but... I guess we get to watch. Oh, that's going to be my question too. My daughter is a pilot and yesterday she picked up, she's flying up today to uh, her shift, her rotation. And she picked the book up and she's like, mom, is it okay if I take a book? And I was like, yeah. And I'm kind of like, what happens when like a new generation who's like an accomplished professional at a really young age reads a book like this? Like what, what happens? That's lovely. Uh, Bo, April, Esty. So when that book, I, so how auto companies and, and mining and everything affected, uh, what I loved in that book is it showed how we took those models and applied them to everything, to government, to our society. And I think what we, the internet and what's happening and gig workers is causing a rethink cultural wide already. So I think that uh, this book and this, uh, these ideas are in the air because essentially when we were just talking about Uber, they're losing trust. Employees are walking out of these companies. Reed Hoffman was talking about this yesterday. Um, not that he's a big seminal guy, but what I'm saying is, is that, uh, we, I think like when you look at these companies, you can see that they've yet to, they're using the old paradigms, but the new paradigm of the way these industries actually work is very different and much flatter. So our society is changing and I have a lot of hope in that. And Samantha, I love your work and your thought and your heart and your, and, and your joy. Thank you. I'll, I'll jump in here. I have um, a 26 year old tech citizen, right, works at Google, and a 30-year-old, uh, similar description, different company. Um, and um, I think since middle school, 
right, it's been clear to me that they, they are in a world that operates by principles that I still feel amazed, to, privileged to have been able to discover in the workplace in the early, from the early days of the internet, which we're now seeing. So I, I really think it's, I, I, I love, Dave, where you started us, right? And Samantha, where your daughter is, all of, all of that. And they still don't get, I mean, we have these conversations over dinners about, they'll blame me for the planet, my generation. And I say, yeah, but you guys are to blame for Trump because you didn't bother to vote. And, and I know what they're talking about, what the accusation to me is. I also know that they don't know anything about Earth Day, right? And all, all, the, all the, other, the, the other side of that, right? But they really don't understand. There's like a missing piece here about the politics and economics about, should we call it citizenship democracy, right? Um, which, which I worry about. And as the parents that we are, along, and, and, the, and the writer of marvelous, important tools for this, um, I worry that our work is not yet done. It's never gonna be done. Thanks. Uh, April, you came in late to the conversation. Anything you'd like to add? And we cannot hear you right now. <clears throat> it may be that she is unable to access the audio um, or that the, the account is just ghosting. Anyway, any, any last words you'd like to offer, Sam? No, I just, you know, it's practice, practice, practice. How do we bring that out as a as a an embodied message wherever we go? Um, let me take us back out by rereading the poem that we started with. And not everybody was here for the poem. So the poem is Today by Mary Oliver. I'll post a link to it in the chat. <clears throat> Today I'm flying low and I'm not saying a word. I'm letting all the voodoos of ambition sleep. The world goes on as it must, the bees in the garden rumbling a little, the fish leaping, the gnats getting eaten, and so forth. But I'm taking the day off, quiet as a feather. I hardly move, though really, I'm traveling a terrific distance. Stillness, one of the doors into the temple. Samantha, thank you so much for your time. Todd, thank you for inviting Samantha to join us here. Um, everybody, thank you for showing up and the awesome focus and questions and fun. Um, and uh, it's a thank wrap. Thank you guys so much. It was Thanks. really great. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.